Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. If you're listening to the audio, if you're joining us on video on YouTube, welcome to this podcast. My guest today is Dr. Burton A. Clark, EFO. He has been in the fire service for 50 years. He was a firefighter in Washington, D.C., Prince George's and Carroll Counties, Maryland, Assistant Fire Chief in Laurel, Maryland, and the Management Science Program Chair and Executive Fire Officer Research Advisor at the National Fire Academy, an Operations Chief during National Disasters and Emergencies for the DHS, FEMA, an Instructor Trainer for the University of Maryland Fire Rescue Institute, an Expert Technical Reviewer for the CDC, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Firefighter Fatality Investigation and Prevention Program, and a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University Center for Injury Research and Policy. He serves on the Doctoral Research Committee at Oklahoma State, Benedictine, North Illinois, Grand Canyon, Fielding, and Valdosta State Universities. In addition, he conducts lectures, workshops, and strategic planning for various educational and governmental organizations. Dr. Clark has a BS in Business Administration from Australia University, an MA in Curriculum and Instruction from Catholic University, and a Doctor of Education in Adult Education from Nova Southeastern University. He has served on 18 doctoral dissertation committees. He studied fire science at Montgomery College with Professor Frank Brannigan, Emergency Management at the Emergency Management Institute, National Security at the National Defense University, and is a graduate of the National Fire Academy Executive Fire Officer Program. He is a nationally certified fire officer for, chief fire officer designee for nine years, and Eagle Scout mentor. Dr. Clark writes, lectures, and teaches fire service research, safety, culture, and professional development worldwide. He is married to Carolyn Smith Clark, a National Fire Academy instructor. They have six children, 14 grandchildren. Anything added since you were last here? Uh, we have three, 3.5 great grandchildren. Okay, 3.5 great grandchildren. His first book, I Can't Save You, But I'll Die Trying The American Fire Culture, Premium Press, Na uh, America from Nashville, Tennessee in 2015. You can find his website at www.americanfireculture.com and he can be reached at drbertclark at gmail.com. And he has a very interesting presentation today. And if you are like myself or Dr. Clark, uh, and you have ever been excited to see that email come that says uh, open for uh, accepting applications or openings for discussions, and you had been prepared and worked hard to prepare one that you could present at FDIC, and then you got the answer that said no. So Dr. Clark's presentation today is entitled How to Lead the Fire Service Over the Next 50 Years, FDIC 2020 Not Selected. Welcome, Dr. Clark. Great to have you back with us. Thank you, Steve. I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, in, in the future, to cut, to cut down on my introduction, you could just say, here's Bert, the old guy. Okay. Uh, because just last week, I had the honor of being inducted into the National Fire Service Heritage Hall of Legends. Oh, congratulations. And um, it, it's, it's quite an honor. I want to thank the, the, the committee that selected me. Um, uh, I'm in awe and surprise in terms of how I could be on the same list with Benjamin Franklin, Me plus too. all the other people that are on that list. It's a relatively new designation started in 2011, but um, what, what an honor to be part of it. And um, uh, ho hopefully somebody that watches this presentation that wasn't selected for FDIC this year, uh, 50 years from now, they will also be added to that list. So whoever that's going to be 50 years from now, congratulations to you, uh, young lady or young woman. Most likely, they're probably not even on the fire service yet. They may be born, but they may not be on the fire service yet. I can almost guarantee you that. So uh, we all build on each other's works, and um, hopefully this will uh, inspire some other folks to, to, go to do good work. Well, that would be great. That's, that's actually the aim of this podcast, is for people to learn from it and to take what they learn and then use it and make it yes. part of their experience in the fire service. That's what we're hoping for. All right, so if we're ready, uh, we'll go ahead and share the screen and uh, start our presentation. You all set? I'm ready. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, right here. Okay, and uh, as you can see, this is the 
opening of the presentation and we'll continue now as it moves along. Are you going to actually put it up one at a time, uh, Steve? Yeah, I'm going to run it. Yeah, that's what I'm... Can you, can you do that where they can see the whole screen? Because yes, some of the letters are small. I just said, um, I'm, I did it before with F, the F5 key, and I'm trying to do it again with the F5 key because I'm... There we go. All right. There we go. Very good. Great. All right. That's perfect. Thank you. Well, again, uh, back up one. Again, this is my FDIC uh, presentation that I've submitted, uh, but didn't get selected. Please don't say that I'm complaining. I'm not complaining at all. Uh, Bobby Holt and I had a very nice conversation about this. Uh, they have thousands of applications and they can only pick a few. I've had the honor and privilege of going to my first FDIC in 1972, speaking there over a dozen times, doing hot classes there. So uh, there's no, uh, I don't feel bad at all, I understand. And you gotta give uh, spaces for the new guys uh, to come in. But then I wanna thank Steve Green for letting me do this uh, 50th anniversary uh, FDIC presentation virtually, because now it'll be archived forever and uh, folks in the future can look at it. So that's the title. Next slide, Steve. So the idea is that change is the only absolute. Uh, that, that's for me, for you, for the fire service, for the world, that change is the only absolute. And most of the time, we're just not even aware of it because it happens every day. Over time, we can see it. There could be some significant kind of things. The fact that this presentation is being recorded would, could not have happened 25 years ago. This is a relatively new concept. In the, in the past, the only way to get FDIC presentations would actually go to FDIC. Well, now because of the coronavirus, the whole world has changed and FDIC was canceled. Who knows what's gonna happen next year? But this is a way that technology has now allowed me to actually do a FDIC presentation that wasn't selected uh, with, with the same hope that it can help folks. So in my life, I've come to, the, to, to realize that change is the only absolute. And I think the earlier you accept that, the easier it is for you to embrace change. It also lets you control, not control, it also lets you manage change or to push change in whatever discipline you're dealing with, with yourself personally, with your occupation, with your family, with your life, just how you see things. And uh, that's an important part of, I think, becoming mature and wise is to understand that change is the only absolute. Sure. Next slide, please. So if you've ever been to the Fire Academy or one of my classes, you realize that we always try to connect practice with theory. And I, I can't help myself so when you came to my classes at the Fire Academy, there was always some theory and theorists that you may have never even heard of that we used to explain why things were happening the way they were. And that's what we're trying to do here. Steve, can I ask you, I see your picture. Are they seeing my picture in the box? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. I got it. I just see you. Okay. So if change is the only absolute, here, here are the parameters under which I see change. I'm also writing a paper on this. So this may be my first paper in 2021. Um, I look at change from a social, political, economic, and technological standpoint, that that's what culture is made up of. Then I bring in Shine. Some of my material is about Shine's work on organizational culture and change. Shine talks about artifacts, espoused beliefs, underlying assumptions. Before Shine, there was the diffusion model that was created by Rogers in terms of how society moves from one point to another. He's the one that took the bell curve that we're all familiar with and put us all in it. Most of us live our lives in the mean, in the middle, either early majority or late majority. That's where most people do their social, political, economic, and technological aspects of their life. On the, out, on the outside are what's called outliers. They, on the left-hand side, they're the, the innovators. They're the people that are not satisfied with the norm and they want, to push, they want to push it. They come up with a new idea. Early on, some say, that's a pretty good idea. I think I'm going to try that. So they become part of that new, new norm. Then when the, when the first part of the majority says, yes, this is doable, it's easier to do it the, old, the new way than the old way. And finally, the late majority said, look, 
it's, it's more economical for me to do it this way than the old way, and that could become part of it. On the other side are the laggers, those that refuse to do something, and they have to be drawn kicking and screaming. And ultimately, you know, they can become uh, the people we put in jail. Uh, for example, at one time, it was illegal to grow tomatoes because tomatoes were perceived to be uh, a poison. Uh, so it was, can you imagine illegal to grow tomatoes? Because the, the acid in tomato on pewter and those kind of things, it could cause people to get sick. But later on, they realized it wasn't the tomato that was a bad thing. It was that combination. So if, if we can think tomatoes are evil, you know, we can think anything. And it takes time for society to change its ideas. Right. Um, if you took some of our classes, you saw the Joel Barker tapes about paradigms. Paradigm, uh, Joel Barker talks about the pioneers, then the basic paradigm that we all believe in. And he says, we, sometimes we get stuck in paradigm paralysis that the way we know how to do things is the only way. And sometimes it's hard to break that. And uh, another one you've probably heard of is Morris Massey guy says that uh, who we are, where we were, when, and how we perceive the world, but that can change with some kind of significant emotional event. Something can happen that allows us to say, oh, I think I can do this. I'm gonna to try to do this a new way and it can change us forever. So in the article I'm writing, I'll get into more depth, but that's the basic theoretical uh, foundation for this idea that change is the only absolute. And the more we understand the culture change process, I think the better we will be able to control our own future by accepting change, understanding change, and then driving change. Next slide, please, Steve. Here's a video of that that takes maybe a minute or two to show how one person doing something can then automatically or suddenly influence a whole crowd of people. And we'll talk about it when we come back. Can you show the tape, uh, Steve? Mm -hmm. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. 
when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Quite the experience. All right. Isn't, isn't that amazing? Um, yeah, we spend most of our life really being followers at some level, either the first one in or the second one or part of the mass. And you can see this throughout history. I can see it throughout my life. Uh, you can watch it today because today with the mass media and, and, and Facebook and Twitter and all those kind of things, it's so easy to join the crowd uh, and there's not much risk in, involved, but particularly when you can be anonymous. So that's why you have, and then the media capitalizes on that because these are the strange dancing people right around and we, we go to the shiny object uh, without really knowing the depth of it. So uh, I think this is such a powerful idea and we have to ask ourselves, uh, am I, who am I following? Why am I following it? And uh, what are the consequences of this? So thanks for showing that. Sure. Now, the other part that I think is critical in terms of our times right now is um, uh, uh, the whole idea of um, white privilege. And I know it's unusual for me to talk about political kinds of things, but uh, certainly my family has talked about that with all that's going on. And, and I think the challenge is this word privilege, that uh, uh, we, have, we, have, we don't want to admit that we have privilege. We want to think we work for everything we have and we deserve everything we have. So this is how I deal with it. Um, the fact that I was born was pretty much uh, a statistical outlier because I don't know how many sperm and egg have to actually exchange before an actual birth can take place, but it's millions. So, so therein, therein lies the fact that I was born in the first place that I had nothing to do with. It had to do with two horny teenagers. They weren't horny teenagers, they were, they were my parents. But the idea is they, they had relationships and I'm the outcome of it. We don't know if they went into it thinking that they were gonna make this human being, but they, it, it happened. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of times it doesn't happen. So the fact that I was born and then who, the parents I'm born to, my biology starts, starts my trajectory from day one. From the first time those eggs, that egg and sperm meet, you know, Bert Clark is on his way that I had nothing to do with. It was just chance of the stars. So now I start developing. Well, in my development process, my brain did not develop like everybody else. I am dyslexic, which means that my brain works differently than most of the world. There's somewhere between five and 10% of the population are dyslexic. We don't fit into the norm. We see things differently. How it manifests for me, my reading and spelling is horrendous. And it's been that way my whole life. And it does not get better. As a matter of fact, you will see that in one of these slides when I point it out. So my dyslexia is something I live with all the time. And so, but that has shaped my way of seeing the world and, and how I respond to it. That's one example. I had nothing to do with that. The other one, when I was being developed, I have six lumbar vertebrae instead of five. So that means I'm taller than the average person. When I popped out, I was taller than most. Throughout my entire life, I've been tall for my, pop, my, for my generation. Um, right now I'm 6'4", so I'm still tall. Again, being a tall male separates me from other people and gives me opportunity that I would not have had if I didn't have that extra height. Now, I'm not a basketball player, so I didn't get that gene to be able to play basketball but I can get stuff off the top shelf that other people can't get. And I was the one when I was assigned to truck companies to always put them damn wooden chocks and sprinkler heads that were going off. In the summertime, it was okay, but the wintertime, I froze my butt off because I would get all wet and have to go out in there. So 
So when we talk about, um, again, this is not a political statement about white privilege or ethnicity or any kind of stuff, but it, but I think I have to understand that how I see the world comes from places that I had nothing to do with. So it has to, it makes me much more humble that anything I've been able to achieve because maybe 51% was my fault, but 49% is just luck of the draw. So now one of my first institutions I was involved with was the YMCA. So I was institutionalized into this YMCA culture and also the American Red Cross culture from uh, being a swimming instructor and lifeguard. So I was taught that at a very early age. I started going to the Y was when I was probably seven or eight. And I, I even worked there after I got married. I was uh, the uh, aquatic director at the, at the YMCA in Washington, DC, a, a block from the White House before I was even a firefighter. So those kinds of things influence you throughout your whole life. The same thing with the American Red Cross and being a lifeguard and a CPR instructor and all that kind of stuff. So you have to take that in consideration in terms of how I was able to do these kind of things. You can't be Burt Clark, but you can be you. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do, be you. And there are commonality and common themes uh, that all of us go through. Next slide. Now I end up in the fire service in 1970. These are all the institutions, the, the patches are all the institutions that influenced me. If I had been at different institutions, I may have been diff influenced differently. But those organizations shaped who I am today. So, you know, they're all just symbols of organizations. Uh, anybody that goes on the internet knows about the Kentland Volunteer Fire Department, Company 33. It's got to be the busiest vol all volunteer fire department in the country. I was a DC firefighter. Just the fact that I was a DC firefighter gives me instant credibility, whether I deserve it or not. I was part of that organization. The Laurel Volunteer Fire Department has been around over 200 years. They gave me the opportunity to do things nobody else ever would have done. And finally, the last department I was, I was a member of Mount Airy, and I, I went back to Laurel too to, to do some more years. But they all gave me opportunities to do things that shaped who I am. And finally, where most of you know me from, is the National Fire Academy. So when I combined all that stuff and realized I had 50 years in the fire service, this is the, the, the front side of the coin that I created to try to capture the essence of who I am and what I think is important. So when you do something for 50 years, you got to celebrate it. Uh, I haven't done, I haven't accomplished anything without the support of Carolyn Smith Clark, my loving wife. So she is part of who I am and how I am and how I think. When it comes down to the technical stuff, uh, I may be the only coin that has a smoke detector and a sprinkler head on it because that has to be the most important part of fire culture in the 21st century. We're not gonna do it with ladders and hose, but we better make sure there's smoke detectors and sprinklers in that building or we are going to have catastrophic losses that we cannot imagine today. And finally, the hand at the top, that's the hand of Prometheus, the uh, Greek Titan that stole fire from the gods and gave it to humans. And if you've read the Prometheus paradox, that tells you why we still need to understand that today. So um, who I am is based on where I was when I was being created and shaped. So keep that in mind. Next slide, Steve. I get accused of being an intellectual and a and, uh, college boy from day one because I was the only guy in my company that got time off to go to class. So that was not the norm when I was in the fire service. And even today, they tell you, well, you can't learn it in books. You got to go squirt water. Well, you know, I think you learn a lot out of books. And uh, if you didn't, they would give surgeons scalpels and let them go out and start cutting people's arms off before they sent them to school. Well, we don't do that. We should not do that for firefighters either. Any life and death discipline should not be based solely on experience because that is not going to teach you what you need to know and how to do it. You need to have that training, that education, that science and research behind your practice. And you only get that 
through the academic uh, environment that creates the knowledge that we practice. So I'm grateful for all the schools that let this uh, below average student in and um, uh, uh, I'm grateful, so thank you. If you're not in college, get in college. Uh, you, you, it's, it's an investment in your own human capital and you'll never regret it. Next slide, Steve. So uh, I ended up on the back of my book, my entire philosophy of the fire service is captured in this one paragraph. Society needs to change how it thinks and feels about fire death. When a civilian is killed by fire, it's not an act of God. And when a firefighter is killed, it's not part of the job. When there's a fire death, something went wrong. The public, as well as the fire service, can do better to prevent and survive fire. I believe that with all my whole heart, and that's why I do all I do today, to try to convince people we need to change the culture if we want a different outcome. Next slide. So, what, what happened to me that, that encouraged me or was a significant emotional event that caused me to go through some kind of change process? Well, when I joined Kentland in 1970, you know, I had no notion of wanting to be a firefighter. But next thing you know, I was, here I was a volunteer at Kentland. On my first call, the stories in my book, on my first call, I almost killed another firefighter. That was a significant emotional event because I realized I did not know what I was doing and I was dangerous. It changed me forever. You'll see how in a minute. On my first house burning, when they took me into the basement fire, my metal helmet came off. When I put it back on, the ear flap went up into, my, into my, uh, the crown of the hat and the helmet was so hot, it burned the top of my ears. So... But my first house burning, I got my damn ears burned. And that was not a fun experience. Uh, also, by 1971, I had ran over 275 calls at Kentland. That was the fifth most calls. And I loved it. I was addicted. I fell in love with it. And I couldn't get enough of it. I had to learn everything I needed to know about the fire service. And what I didn't know is that I was always going to be trying to make it better. Next slide. Who wouldn't want to join Kentland with an elevated boom like that? I know. In the early days. So after my first fire, I went on a campaign to learn everything I possibly could. This was even before I went to rookie school. And uh, the materials were there, but nobody was showing it to me. So I got the book off the shelf and borrowed it. And I read everything in it. And I learned everything in it. And I went to every piece of equipment on the apparatus. And I learned how everything worked. I asked people. I took the responsibility to train myself as best I possibly could because this is a life and death discipline and, and you can never know enough. There's always more to learn. Then I realized, hey, you can get paid to do this. So I joined the DC fire department and uh, I was like a sponge. I could not get enough. Uh, I was so obsessed. I graduated number one from my rookie school and got the scholarship award because I, there was always more to learn. I had to learn more. So not only was I learning the technical stuff, but I also was going to college at the time. And I started applying all the things I learned at school to the fire service. And as Steve mentioned in my opening, I've worked on doctoral dissertations, trying to help firefighters learn how to do the science and research so we can make our discipline better. And um, you, you make it better, you know, little teeny tiny changes at the time, but it can be made better and all of us can do something. Next slide. So another significant event, we had seven fire fatalities in three separate house fires in Laurel in 74. All of them were dead before we got there. Uh, that was, like I said, a significant emotional event in my life. And all my training, all my skill, all the equipment couldn't save those people. But at the time, smoke detectors were first coming on the market and you could, they cost like 60 bucks, but if you bought them in a, in a case, they were cheaper. So we got lots of people to buy them in cases and then for 30 bucks and got them in people's houses. So again, that was my realizing I couldn't save people as well as smoke detectors could. So we were on a, national, we were on a campaign, got some recognition. So we were, the law of fire department was one of the first early adapters of smoke detectors. Next slide. Now, if you remember, you can have an idea, 
but it has to be visible, has to be public. So at the time, uh, the law of fire department put in for the national smoke detect, put in for the national fire prevention campaign. And lo and behold, we won the state campaign for fire prevention with our smoke detector program. Um, in, in the uh, selection committee was somebody from the DC mayor's office who found out that this volunteer fireman in uh, Mount in uh, Laurel had done the smoke detector stuff. Next thing you know, I'm detailed to the mayor's office in Washington, D.C. to help Washington, D.C. develop their smoke detector training program. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. NFPA was coming that particular year. So I wrote to them just out of, I was John Q. Nobody and just wrote to them and said, hey, the D.C. Fire Department is doing this smoke detector program for its firefighters. Would you like me to come talk about it? They wrote back and said, yes. So in 1977, I gave two presentations at NFPA conference in Washington, D.C. The first one was on smoke detectors about the D.C. Fire Department smoke detector training program. In the audience that day was Dave McCormick, the superintendent of the National Fire Academy. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. But he saw me do this presentation. A year later, I was detailed to the National Fire Academy to do the same thing nationwide. That's, that's one of those chance kind of things. Right place, right time, right message. Uh, but we did smoke detectors all over the country, including live burn demonstrations. They were, they were some of the first live burn demonstrations even before the, the sprinkler stuff, the sprinkler trailers today. So just being on the cutting edge, I was the crazy dancing guy and somebody said, who happened to be the superintendent, hey, let's get this crazy dancing guy to come here. And next thing you know, I'm at the National Fire Academy doing this nationwide. Next slide. Now, also at that presentation at, in, in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. in 1977, I put in another request to do an article, to do a presentation about firefighter safety attitude because I had published my first article in 1976 about I don't want my ears burned. And sure enough, they accepted it. So my old professor, Frank Brannigan, told me that I was the only person ever to give two presentations at, F at the NFPA conference. And the other one was on uh, attacking the firefighter safety attitude. And that's where I started doing my research on culture and, and how we start thinking about culture. You know, way back then, you know, for some reason, I just had to think about that kind of stuff. You know, we brag about firefighter is the most dangerous occupation, but are we bragging or are we, are we complaining? Therein lies I think a core issue mm -hmm. Very and much so. you know, we're still dealing with that today. When a firefighter is killed, is it a line of duty death or is it an occupational fatality? Simply how we think about those words determine what we do to fix it. Uh, as of right now, the 737 max aircraft is still grounded and they only crashed two of them because they haven't fixed the problem yet 100%. So society knows how to change things when it wants to. And that's, that's a pretty challenging uh, thing to discuss and talk about. Uh, and certainly one of the ones that the fire service needs to talk about. Next slide. Remember how I told you at my first house burning, I burned my ears? At some point in time, I don't know if it was the, the, the second or third FDIC I walked through, when I was walking through the hall, I saw my first Nomex hood. I think they were like $23 and some change. And I actually had the amount of money and I bought it because it was a hood that you could put on to keep your ears from getting burned. So I was the first guy in Washington, D.C. fire department to have a Nomex hood. I also carried it back and forth with me to my volunteer department. Well, anyway, when I first started wearing this thing on fires, you can imagine my brother firefighters, uh, they did not have complimentary uh, comments for me about wearing this hood. Um, but after a few working fires, it was actually one of the squad guys, you know, the guys that walked through fire, came up to me and said, Bert, where'd you get that? So I showed him the label on the inside. Next thing you know, squad guys were, were buying their own and starting to wear them. Because 
it kept you from getting your ears burned. So now today, a firefighter would not think about or shouldn't think about going into a burning building without their Nomex hood on. But somebody had to invent it and then somebody had to start wearing it, even though people thought you were crazy. Uh, but that squad guy gave this crazy dancing guy a lot of credibility when they started wearing it. And it became the norm for the fire service. And um, so, so one of the articles in my book is firefighters have to get killed. It's part of the job. You notice that in that quote down the bottom, I didn't put a P, I put it, I just discovered it today. I said, it's art of the job. That's my mm -hmm. dyslexia. I can't tell you how many times I've reviewed this slide deck. And it wasn't until today that I finally read, firefighters have to get killed. It's art of the job. It's not, that's supposed to be a P, part of the job. So, so who we are never really goes away. And you just have to embrace it. That's why I pointed it out that, yep, that's Burt Clark. That's my dyslexia showing up on a simple three-letter word. And, uh, but that does not keep me from doing a presentation. That's the important part. Uh, don't, don't let your difference stop you from doing something. Just acknowledge it and almost value it. Um, Great point. Ne next slide. We're, we're going to take the break here. All right, right, okay. right. Take our break. All take right, so folks, you. we're going to just take a break. If you're watching the video, it's going to seem like we never went anywhere. On the audio, we'll be right back right after these words. So please stay tuned. And welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. L watching the video, nothing happened, right? If you're listening to the audio, you heard some of our uh, public service announcements. We're going to continue now with my guest, Dr. Bert Clark. I'm going to go back to sharing the screen. And we're going to... Um, be sure that we are um, at a point where uh, we're hoping that you're really picking up. And, and just off the air, we finished with a slide and I said to Dr. Clark, you know, even though we, it was a mistake that you didn't realize until today, when you look at it, that, and, and the other mistake, by the way, is that there would normally would be an apostrophe in the word it's as, a, as an abbreviation for it is. Yet it's spelled this way is possessive. And when you, I just said to him, I said, a lot of firefighters still believe that dying on as a line of duty death, it's part of the art of the job. And it's, in other words, fire, it's art of the job really is true. And we have to be careful not to let ourselves think of ourselves as the Van Goghs and the Monets of firefighting. It is not art, it is skill. And the better skills we have, as Dr. Clark has been saying today, with the more learning we do, and you know, if you regularly listen to this podcast, that learning is an integral part of what we talk about on these shows. And he's very right. Firefighters should not think that getting killed is just a natural part of the job or it's part of the art of the job. So we're gonna continue now with our guest, with our next slide. Okay, if it'll work for us. <sighs> it was doing great, we were doing great. All right, let me stop the share for one second. Bring up the, we'll come right back. I'll make sure that's done. out of the way. Here's our PowerPoint. And there we go. Okay, let me come back and share the screen. There we go. Okay, Dr. Clark. Oop, there we go. Do you see it, sir? Dr. Clark? Dr. Clark? Not yet. You don't see it? Yeah, I, it's not yet there. Oh, it's up on the screen right now. Now yeah. I do, yep. Okay. Yep, I got it. I'm ready. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Welcome cool. back, everybody. Uh, I never went looking for these events that impacted on me that then I turned into something. 
They just happened organically, I guess. So the next one was uh, 2001, uh, before 9-11, I was a captain on a ladder truck, and uh, we had a metal plating plant fire, and I should have called a mayday and didn't do it. So again, that story's in the book. Uh, but when I started looking at why didn't I call this mayday, is that you know, we weren't trained to do it. And that's when I started going into trying to figure out uh, why don't we call mayday, and I ended up writing an article uh, in the Oct October Fire Command called Mayday, 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 the firefighters know when to call it. And I was actually writing it while I was working the 9-11 uh, disaster down in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, in it, it, as part of the article, and again, the article's in the book, uh, I, tr I did, did some benchmarking with Navy fighter pilots in terms of how they were taught to make the decision to eject from an aircraft because none of our literature had guidelines as to when to do it. And in that article, because firehouse.com was willing to publish it, it got thousands of reads and, and thousands of re referrals or, or clicks and then forwarded to so many people. So I knew I was onto something and I just, I couldn't stop and uh, just kept working on it, wrote some more 10 articles, got other people involved. My good friend, Raul Angulo, a captain in the Seattle Fire Department, and Chief Steve Auk, who was uh, an assistant chief in uh, Indianapolis. Steve has since passed away, uh, but they have to be acknowledged, those two folks that really gave credibility. They, they, were, they were the second guys that got up and danced with this crazy kid about May Day. And uh, they gave a lot of credibility to what I was thinking and uh, helped design the material. And then it was presented at FDIC and Firehouse Expo as both hot classes and uh, classroom classes. Next slide. I want to, before we move to the next slide, I want to add to this because I had not reviewed your slide presentation in advance. Yet, nevertheless, along with over another half a dozen great brother firefighters uh, and instructors, we are planning as a fundraiser for our new uh, nonprofit uh, in the first of the year, we are planning a May Day webinar, not about how to call a May Day, but we're talking about, do, do you know what to do when a May Day is called on an emergency scene? We know that the automatic reaction is everybody drops what they're doing and runs over to see what's going on, what they can do to help. But if you have two crews upstairs in a burning house, and you're the protecting, protective line downstairs, you can't drop that line and run away. So we're gonna, we have at least, I have like a half a dozen uh, instructors have already signed on to be part of this webinar in January about do you know what to do when a May Day is called? That's great, Steve. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. we Will do, thank you very much, sir. Okay, we're moving to the next slide. Oh, come on, let's do it again. All right, we'll do it this way. Okay. So again, remember, you, you can have an idea, but you have to have people willing to help. So the, the, the May Day doctrine that exists today could not have happened if all of these players were not involved with it. The uh, Maryland Fire Rescue Institute, uh, the individual was Danny Boyd. He was the, the prop manager, one of the trainers at Bifree. He designed our first ball pit uh, when I asked him. And Danny came up with it. It was great. Then I had to, I had to, I had the materials, the props, but I didn't have anybody that would let me teach it to them. And if it was, wasn't for Dave Barry, who was a battalion chief in the Anne Arundel County Fire Department, it would have never been recorded. So Dave and the Anne Arundel County Fire Department allowed me to come in and, and with Dave's help and teach the May Day class for the first time. And then uh, Brent Batla with training division uh, built a whole series of props and we were able to deliver the program uh, with his fire department and record it down in Texas. Uh, Motorola supplied the uh, radios. Firehouse let us do hot classes. FDIC let us do hot classes. And, and uh, finally, uh, uh, they, they were able to produce free of charge some 5,000 May Day CDs that then the Fire Academy distributed or could be distributed nationwide. And that was Randy Corbin came to do that. And all this was done with no money. Uh, you probably couldn't do it today. 
But this was all just done between a, a handshake between Burt Clark and all these players because it was the right thing. Nobody made any money off of this because it was the right thing to do for the fire service. Um, and finally, the last thing was we had to get the Mayday standard changed because in the NFPA standard, it said firefighters could not use the word Mayday, if you can believe that. It took 10 years from the time I wrote the first article until the NFPA standard was changed that said, because the standard it said, said firefighters cannot use the word Mayday because it will interfere with airplanes and ships at sea. It actually said that verbatim in the standard, in the appendix. So to get that changed, it took 10 years of that whole infrastructure system to change. And uh, thank goodness for the International Association of Firefighters. Next slide, Steve. It wasn't Burke Clark that got it changed. It was the International Association of Firefighters, the union I'd been a member of for years. They were the only ones that had the clout, the political clout, to get NFPA to change the standard. They went there uh, and it wasn't until January, 2012, that NFPA finally changed the standard to allow firefighters to use the word Mayday. Can you imagine that? 10 years to change one word, but that's how change happens. Somebody has, you have to have the crazy dancer and you have to have people right behind them, but it takes mass, it takes institutions to actually <clears throat> change culture. Next slide. So they actually had to say in the standard, Mayday shall be the word declared by firefighters. And it was interesting, uh, next slide, Steve. When, uh, when I was putting this together, I knew uh, agency saying that you can't use the word Mayday. So luckily, I got a letter from the National Urban Search and Rescue Committee, a federal agency, a federal group, saying that firefighters could use the word Mayday. And I knew that that was in direct contradiction to the NFPA standard, but I had this letter. And the federal government trumps NFPA uh, and fire scope. So uh, with that letter in hand, uh, when they tried to shut me down, I showed them that letter and I said, oh, well, I guess Clark is right. He can use that word Mayday. And then finally, the IAFF received their Fireground Survival Grant, and they included Mayday in their curriculum. So again, that gave them the, the uh, motivation to, to fix the NFPA standard. And uh, so they did. And they, and they used the letter that I got back from the federal government. But just, again, I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm just showing you the cultural issue. The letter I wrote to... Um, the federal government, the, the, the uh, committee, I used on, I was an assistant chief in the law of voluntary fire department. So I used law of voluntary fire department letterhead. And they wrote the letter back to me at the law of voluntary fire department as assistant chief law of voluntary fire department. So that's the letter I had. It was on law of voluntary fire department letterhead. But so the union had that letter, but they, they, they didn't want the letter coming to a volunteer fire chief. So they took that part off of it off and put in that I worked at the National Fire Academy and DHS because that gave me more credibility when I wasn't doing it for the federal government. I didn't have the authority to do it for the federal government, but I did have the authority for the law of voluntary fire department. But the union scratched that part out and just said, so that's in the NFPA standard, it says, it identifies me as working at the National Fire Academy. Well, I don't want any general counsel coming after me because I did not write the letter initially from the federal government. I wrote it from my volunteer fire department, but the, but the union uh, used my other title uh, to uh, include it in the standard. So I just thought that was some political uh, background in terms of how the world really works. And that's what, you, that's what the future leaders are gonna have to deal with. You have to be able to use the systems that are there and let them be themselves. Don't try to change them. Let them be themselves because it's all helping it we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. So uh, I want to thank all the institutions that allowed this to happen. So now firefighters can call May Day, and I'm sure it's saved a lot of firefighters' lives. Oh, sure. Next slide, Steve. So um, 
another incident that happened in uh, 2003, uh, Brian, Hel uh, Brian Hutton uh, was killed and Brian was a National Fire Academy graduate and he was ejected because he didn't have a seatbelt on. And uh, this, this was another significant emotional event in my life. We can have all this fancy stuff, but if we can't get firefighters to put their seatbelt on, uh, what, why are we going to work every day, you know? And, and I think if we solve the seatbelt problem, that can help us solve lots of our problems with our uh, injuries and deaths or mortality and uh, morbidity. So uh, we started the national, we started the, uh, I wrote about it. Uh, we started the National Seatbelt Pledge Campaign in 2005. That was taken over by the Fallen Firefighters Foundation in 2006. Uh, but we're st we still have not solved that problem. Just this year, a firefighter was killed driving home from their assignment at a brush fire in a department vehicle, had a wreck, was ejected and died. Obviously, they did not have their seatbelt on. She, the firefighter was like 22 or 23 years old. Mm -hmm. old. And, um, you know, it just broke my heart. Um, we're all wrapped around the axle with how bad the brush fires are out in the West. But for some reason, we could not get that firefighter to wear their seatbelt. So if you, if you think you can't make change, you can make change one click at a time. You don't have to get an NFPA standard change to make a difference. Right. We play uh, one of two PSAs dealing with seatbelts uh, on almost every podcast to get Thanks, to, to Thank wear you. them. Next slide. My interest in this whole idea about culture started at the first, I think it was 2004, the first uh, NF, uh, Fallen Firefighters Foundation conference. And the first, one, first of 16 life safety initiatives they came up with was this culture one. Now I happened to be the facilitator for that group. So I helped that group write this first initiative about our need to define and advocate the need for culture change within a fire service relating to safety, incorporating leadership, management, supervision, accountability, and personal responsibility. So if we don't get to this underlying cultural issue, you know, we can't change anything. That's not just for us, but that's for everything we do in society. That's why it's all connected together. And uh, this, is, this is basically what I'm writing about now in terms of changing uh, fire culture. Next slide. So, so after serving on that committee, uh, the last project that I worked on before I retired from the fire academy was the, uh, the uh, uh, IAFF was given a grant along with the, all the agencies, the, uh, the fire chiefs, the union, NFPA, National Volunteer Fire Council, you know, all, all those letters were given this grant to look at culture for the first time. And I served on this committee. And um, so this, this is really the first time that a, that a government document came out and said, culture is important. We need to do something about the culture if we want a different outcome. It's not, it's not only about technology. It's not only about more money. It's not only about discipline. It's not only about, it's a, it's a systematic pro problem and a systematic solution that we have to look at. So we must address culture uh, to change behavior. Next slide. Now, I, I also serve as a technical reviewer on NIOSH reports. So usually when there's a Mayday situation or a seatbelt situation, they call me to be the technical expert. So there was one rollover incident where the driver was ejected and had no seatbelt on. So as I was just doing the standard stuff, I realized there needs to be another breakthrough. We need to address this issue of culture. And NIOSH had never talked about culture in their materials. It was always about engineering, about having the SOP, about having a training program, but they never actually used the word culture as something that needed to be studied. So I took the risk 
And when I wrote up my report, I included a culture factor for the first time. I didn't know how they were going to respond because they're a bunch of engineers and epidemiologists and they don't deal with this touchy feely stuff about culture. But I tried it. And sure enough, this one crazy dancing guy, remember I'm the tra crazy dancing guy because I think culture is important. So I write this up and put it in it. Next slide. For the first time, NIOSH puts culture into one of the recommendations related to a firefighter fatality. It had never been done before. So one crazy dancing guy got somebody else to join him the people at, NF, at, at NIOSH and put it in there. I think that could help us tremendously in the future. So a recommendation under this fatality, recommendation five, fire departments should ensure the fire service culture does not contribute to firefighter occupational injuries and fatalities when making the decisions to ensure both the fire service culture and the department safety culture can be moved forward together in a common sense safety oriented approach. And, and I'm hoping now that somebody will take up the mantle that when we do an investigation of a firefighter fatality, like NIOSH does, somebody also does a cultural review. And those kinds of things can be done today. That has to be part of our future fire service analysis of who we are and why we behave the way we do. We have to understand that culture. So I'm looking forward to the uh, young person out there that takes us on uh, and finds, finds a way for us to do these cultural analysis, because until we do, uh, we're not going to change our behavior. Next slide, Steve. So uh, I keep trying. Uh, I've been around the fire service 50 years in that for now. Uh, they tell me I'm a legend. That just means I'm an old guy and been around a long time. And uh, I'm grateful for that opportunity. Uh, my book has been out there for a while. Uh, the drawing is my granddaughter. My granddaughter um, is an artist. And uh, she, when she was still in high school, she uh, did a, a painting of my, co of my cover of my book. And it's uh, one of my most precious uh, things I have because she was nice enough to do that. So as you, go, as you get older in life, you realize that the fire service is not your total life. You have to be in balance between your family life and your firehouse life. And uh, I've been lucky to be able to have a wife and children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren that uh, bring me lots of, uh, of love. And you have to understand the art side of yourself, uh, like we were talking about, uh, Steve, uh, to then appreciate the science part of yourself. Right. So uh, if you turn another slide, you'll see how Clark is trying to work on his art side. Um, that's uh, if you can pick me out of that picture, naturally I'm the tallest person in the picture. That's my uh, great grandmother, Maddie Hammond and uh, her great grandchildren. And um, yeah, that's you behind. And, yep. I'm standing right behind her. That's me with the big ears. Um, and uh, all, all of us are uh, senior citizens today in that picture almost. Uh, but that's only part of it because um, what, what I discovered, and you know, I've talked about this, Steve, is I discovered Maddie's poetry. It was willed to me, so I have her poems. And they were certainly a significant part of my life and influenced me dramatically. And if you turn to like next slide, you know, I... Uh, if you came to one of my FDIC presentations in 2004, I think, uh, I read a poem and said that someday I would publish her work. And just this year, I published uh, Maddie Hammond's uh, collection of poetry. And uh, also that I had no idea was gonna happen. A friend of mine, Nancy Funk at Penn State, uh, she wrote a play and the play is online. It's a recording because of COVID, we couldn't get out. So we made it into a radio play. So there's a radio play out there about uh, my great grandmother's poetry and life. And uh, I'm the moderator and uh, some of my story is in there too. So uh, it's been a wonderful 50 year journey and uh, it's not over. Only God knows how much longer I've got to do this, but uh, it's been a, a journey and a wonderful 
wonderful trip. I am so grateful for all the people that have been part of it. Next slide, Steve. And uh, finally, if you've ever heard the starfish story, uh, there's plenty of stars for us to throw out there. And uh, there's some rookie firefighter looking for something to do. Uh, just keep your eyes and your ears and your heart open and you will find it. And uh, you too will be able to make a significant difference uh, in, your, in your career and in the people around you and in the fire service. And next thing you know, uh, you'll be added to a list of uh, legends uh, along with uh, Ben Franklin and so many other folks, and uh, it'll be a wonderful journey. So uh, thank you, Steve, for letting me do this. Thanks for, to F the FDIC for letting me do this. And um, that's my story, Steve. Well, thank you, Dr. Clark. I, I, I think you brought up some very silly points. And I think the most important thing, again, we've talked about this before, is the concept of the fire culture. You and I, both old guys, share what we learned from we're not just looking at today, we're looking at what we learned from when we started back in the 70s and how things were different for us. But the job wasn't different. It was how we did it, the tools we had at the time, but the job was still the same as Ben Franklin. We're going, we're not firefighters, we're gonna volunteer to help our community by being a firefighter and help putting out fires. That's what the culture is. And we've grown in many ways, many positive ways over those times. I mean, you know, what you and I both saw was, for example, the introduction of radios for every firefighter. You know, the old days when we started, if there was an evacuation order, you only had to listen for the horns because that was the only way we knew if we were in the interior of a building, we only knew if that we heard all those air horns going off at the same time to get the hell out of Dodge. Today, every firefighter has a radio. Um, every radio has the ability for a Mayday button. To, so that the, um, the IC and every command officer will know that there's a, a mayday call going out at that time. Even if the vocal part of the signal doesn't come out, that button is pushed and it alerts all the radios and dispatch as well. Those are major things. The change in the, in the clothing that we wear uh, from the pull-up boots that you and I first wore, first wore like that was going to protect us uh, from water. They were great as long as we didn't go deep. They were terrific. Yet today, even with the best bunker gear we have, we're in the midst now of this major turmoil of finding out these uh, carcinogenic compounds, PFAS and PFOS, that's been used since 1977, the year that I started, in our bunker gear for waterproofing, et cetera. But these are man-made chemicals. They never existed in nature before. And now they're called forever chemicals. I just released on yesterday morning, this is today is Tuesday the 20th. Yesterday we released our interview with Robert Ballot, the attorney who uh, was just portrayed in the movie Dark Waters and is now leading the charge for a class action status of a lawsuit for every single firefighter in the United States since 1977 and every single resident of the United States since 1977 because these chemicals are not only in our bunker gear, but they're in our entire water system throughout the country and around the world. Um, and so while this gear does a lot of what it's supposed to do to help us, there's that deep insidious side that we didn't even know about until recently that what's inside that bunker gear may kill us at the same time. So we need to continue this cultural change and we need more leaders from, from the young people who sit, grab hold of this and say, these are things that we want to, we still want to be firefighters and we want to make firefighting a great vocation or avocation but we have to have the right pathways to do it and we need to have the right education to do it and we need educational leaders we need fire leaders all working together as a unit um, to to come together we know you know you and i know wing spreads uh, wing spread conferences um the wing spread seven is being scheduled earlier than supposed to be the word came down to me um and uh, usually it's done every 10 years folks uh, uh, the last one was in what th three years ago, I think. Well, just yeah, just after I started, 2016 was Wing Spread Six. But because of what's going, we're going through with the pandemic. I got word from a contact that they're probably going to be doing that within the next the next year, a, a special Wing Spread conference again. And we need that because we need to work together from all agencies and the, the local, the regional, 
the national agencies to get together. How do we respond in a situation like this? God forbid we should have it again, but it's not over yet. And we need those kind of conferences. So we need these younger people to step up and say, I want to learn more and I want to share what I learn with other firefighters to make those changes, to make our job better and safer for all, both the firefighters and the citizens that we protect. And we need them. And this, this kind of a, a a program that you that you we just did for you that should have been at FDIC um, is one of those programs that can help guide and maybe light the fire under the tuchus of um, of some of these people to say you know what I've seen things but I never had the guts to stand up and say something about it but this guy did he did it 50 years ago and look where he is today he wasn't afraid of standing up against the you know the command structure to make a difference. This- that, you're, you're exactly right, Steve. That's why my next article about uh, understanding uh, the, the culture change uh, process is so important because uh, throughout history, that's what happens. Some, somebody sees something that nobody else sees, and then institutionally, we have to value that. Um, uh, look, look how long ago um, Silent Spring was written. Oh, right. By the late, right? Si- yeah. Silent Spring, which was written in the 60s. Right. That's, that's why this guy is being able to do that that's research uh, or that class action suit today. Right. Right. So, so there's always the, that. That's the foundation of the Prometheus paradox. As, as humans, social, political, economic, and technological factors change, there's, there's consequences for everything that we do. Mm-hmm. The night, the easy part is, hey, this makes me feel good. This is cheaper. This is faster. It's great. But then there's always consequences to that. And unless we start talking about those consequences ahead of time, because change can happen so quickly, then the pandemic is a perfect example, right? We knew about pandemics a long time ago. Sure. But we didn't put the systems in place to take care of them. And we are suffering as, as a result of that. It's not because we didn't know. It's because we, choose, we chose not to do it. Sometimes humans are the slowest to learn. Yes. Yeah. You know? Uh, so that's, that's part of that dichotomy. We can learn, but sometimes we're the slowest. Every time I hear that phrase, which is, uh, I've heard frequently, it, it, I always think of the, the demonstration of the octopus that they put in a jar with a screw top on it. And within 10 minutes, that octopus is out of the jar. Yep. You know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but we don't allow ourselves to think that way. We, very few people are ready to think out of the box, as the old saying goes. Right. You were one and, back then. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's our job to take care of those that take, take care of this planet because it's the only one we've got. You know, sure. it's our spaceship. And if we don't have clean water, we don't have clean air, you know, we're, we don't have uh, justice and equity for everyone, you know, all those kind of things, th- those, those are all part of that system. And, um, uh, yeah, so. Well, we just have to hope and w- that we don't have to wait until the uh, 24th century, as Star Trek was based on, to come to the <laughs> where we don't need money, we don't have crime yeah, anymore, yeah. things like that. It's, it's a great utopian view, but... I think when Roddenberry wrote it, it was it was also a hope and a dream of his. Absolutely. You know, in the sixties that we would grow beyond who we were in the nineteen sixties. Yeah. Take- and I, I just want us to put our seatbelt on. Exactly. exactly. So I mean that's that's the yin and the yang of it, right? You can have utopia. Well, a little thing that we can do every day is to make sure I got my seatbelt on, all the people on my fire truck have their seatbelt on. Exactly. So um, sometimes you you can't let you can't let the big stuff get in the way of your behavior every day right now. Mm-hmm. How you treat people, if you're kind to people, whether you call people names, you know, all those kinds of things impact on the world. So we can have, we can influence the world every day for the better. And that's a choice that we make. Exactly. Very true. Very true. Well, again, my sincere thanks, Dr. Bert, uh, Dr. Clark. <laughs> yes, this Bert is Clark, Bert. But Dr. Clark, for um, joining us again. Uh, I think it was a great presentation. Uh, I hope our viewers not 
just enjoy watching it, but I hope they get the takeaways from it. Yes. There are numerous takeaways from this class, this presentation, and they're all for the positive. And we can start, like you said, with a simple one. When you get on that apparatus, buckle your freaking seatbelt, will you please? <laughs> That's what it boils down to. All right, folks, if, this, if you're watching the video, this will conclude it. On the audio, we'll be right back right after these words. Again, my sincere thanks to Dr. Bert Clark for joining us for this great presentation on, on uh, how to lead the fire service over the next 50 years. We'll be right back for the video. Thanks for watching. We'll be back very soon. Bye-bye.